February 1908, a reporter from the New Zealand Herald walked down to the Wellington courthouse. There had been rumours of problems at the Native Land Court, and he figured he would ask Māori at the court what was going on. Their answers were almost identical. They could not hear what the judge said. He could not speak Māori well. He spoke it like a Pākehā. He mumbled. Consequently, those who were not sitting in the front, near the judge's table, often did not know what case was being heard. More people came over to share their stories. One said there was a case where three people claimed the rights to a bit of land, but because no one had told the claimants when that case was being heard, only one of them was in court. So the judge just gave all the land to the guy who was there. The other two completely missed out. Other cases had dragged on so long, some Māori just gave up and went home. The reporter wrote, Some have gone back to places as distant as the upper Whanganui without a hearing. The expense of long journeys and staying for weeks in the city is no light matter. If we had this kind of dysfunction in a court today, it would be a massive scandal, but this was relatively normal for the native land court. At the time that article was written, the court had been dismantling Māori land ownership for more than 40 years. And modern historians don't have many good things to say about the court. Mm -mm. Professor Stuart Banner called it conquest by contract. Historian Judith Binney described it as an act of war. And Sir Hugh Kafaru said the court was a veritable engine of destruction for any tribe's tenure of land anywhere. This episode, we're looking into the history of the Native Land Court. Or, as some called it, Te Kōti Tango Whenua, the land-taking court. A year after the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840, land ownership looked like this. There were a few tiny islands of Pākehā settlement in an ocean of Māori land. But over the next 180 years, the picture completely reversed. About 95% of Aotearoa's land area was transferred out of Māori hands. Although some land has been bought back by Māori individuals and organisations or returned to iwi as part of treaty settlements. A big part of how that land changed hands was the Native Land Court. And the story of the court isn't just about the transfer of land, but also the transfer of political power and intergenerational wealth. To put it bluntly, this story helps explain why the median Pākehā had $151,000 in wealth in 2021, while the median Māori had just $42,000, about a quarter as much. Thank you, Omi some money, bro. Before we get into the details of what the Native Land Court did, we kind of need to explain why it was set up in the first place. So, the English translation of the Treaty of Waitangi has a bit which says, The chiefs of the United Tribes and the individual chiefs yield to Her Majesty the exclusive right of preemption over such lands as the proprietors thereof may be disposed to alienate. It's a bit of a mouthful. Yeah, but it's actually pretty simple. The, the right of preemption meant Māori couldn't sell land to anyone except the Crown. That was pretty convenient for the Crown, of course. It had a monopoly on buying Māori land, so it could set whatever price it wanted. In seven years, from 1846 to 1853, the Crown bought 13.2 million hectares of land. That is almost half of Aotearoa's land area. The Crown paid less than half a penny an acre on average, plus some promises to set aside land for Māori to live on, and to build roads, hospitals and schools. Many of those promises weren't kept, surprise, surprise, and some iwi, like Ngaitahu, became virtually landless. By 1844, the Crown had spent £4,000 buying land from Māori, and earned £40,000 selling it to settlers. Those profits were used to fund the colonial government and to pay for more settlers to come to Aotearoa. As you might expect, many Māori were deeply anxious about this. They had hoped that the treaty would secure Māori authority, but it wasn't long before Pākehā officials and politicians were making the rules. The only places Māori had real political power was on their own whenua. Now that whenua, that land, and the authority that went with it was vanishing. 
In response, some Māori leaders created networks of hapū and iwi which refused to sell land. The largest and most influential of these networks was the Kingitanga, the Māori King movement, centred in the Waikato region. The Crown wasn't too happy about this anti-land selling movement, but Governor George Grey went back and read the Treaty of Waitangi, realised it said that Māori didn't have to sell land if they didn't want to, and everyone lived happily ever after. What? No, not really, of course. Governor Grey claimed Kingitanga was threatening British colonial authority, sent thousands of troops into the Waikato and Bay of Plenty regions and confiscated nearly 1.4 million hectares of land. The New Zealand wars dragged on in a series of campaigns and led to further raupasu. This was an expensive, bloody and politically unpopular way of obtaining Māori land. However, it meant that by 1865, the Crown had military supremacy in large parts of Aotearoa. This enabled the settler parliament to impose new laws on Māori people and land. Laws like the Native Lands Act, which established the Native Land Court. The court's job was to change the legal status of Māori land so it would be easier to alienate. Alienate? Yeah, it's just a fancy legal word. It means to sell, lease, or give something away. For example, this morning, I alienated a delicious packet of chips from the vending machine. Cool joke, bro. Next, we need to explain the different ways Māori and Pākehā understood rights to land. Say we have a thousand hectares of land occupied by a network of families. Under a British system, that land could be owned through legal title. Basically, legal documents laying out which people owned what land. Any owner with legal title could alienate their share of the land, sell it, lease it, give it away. But in a traditional Māori system, no individual person could alienate land, because land didn't really belong to individuals. Māori held rights to occupy and use the resources of the whenua collectively. These rights came from whakapapa, which linked a hapū or iwi to the whenua, as well as rivers, lakes and coastline. Māori had rights to use resources within the territory of their hapū, and the responsibility to preserve those resources for future generations. This made the process of alienating Māori land pretty frustrating for settlers because they might find one Māori person wanting to sell a bit of land, but unless they could convince the whole hapū to go along with them, it wasn't going to happen. This is where the Native Land Court came in. The court's job was to convert the Māori system of collective land rights into the British system of legal title. And the 1862 Native Lands Act, which first established the Native Land Court, had parts which looked pretty good to modern eyes. For example, it said the court's decision would be made by a panel of Māori judges, assisted by a single Pākehā judge. The Act also set aside the Crown's right of preemption, so Māori were free to alienate land to whoever they wanted, which theoretically could increase the price. So far you might be thinking, hmm, this doesn't seem so bad. Well, strap in, because from here on things get really depressing. For example, the plan to give the court's decision-making power to Māori judges? That never actually happened. In 1865, the Native Lands Act was rewritten. The Māori judges were demoted to assessors, and all practical decision-making power was given to the Pākehā judges. One Māori assessor, Wedemu Te Fiodo, who'd fought alongside British troops in the Waikato War, described the whole system as a scam and resigned his position. He gave a stinging critique of those who continued to participate in it. The assessors are of no use and have little or nothing to say to the cases being tried. They sit like dummies and only think of the pay they're going to get. It's clear the Pākehā judges didn't think the court's job was simply to establish which Māori had rights to what land, but rather to get much of that land into Pākehā hands. Judge Henry Munro, for example, wrote... I maintain that every legitimate encouragement should be held out to Māori to part with their surplus lands to those who can make the use of them for which they were intended. Judge Munro's words were based in a Pākehā worldview that saw land in Aotearoa as a resource. If it wasn't being used productively for farming or housing or mining or some other form of profit, then it was surplus or wasteland. Meanwhile, Māori saw land as part of their identity as well as their economy. The word whenua means land, but also placenta. It's a reference to the belief all people are descended from Papatuanuku, the Earth Mother. 
Mm. And some areas of the whenua might have special significance as a source of food or, or other resources, but all land had value. It didn't matter if it was being used productively in a Pākehā sense. Some land court judges may have just been ignorant of Māori worldviews, but others were straight up hostile. For example, Judge Frederick Manning, who described Māori as mean, treacherous, vain, lying and dangerous, cunning as Satan and dangerous as the serpent. Wait, what? Well, that was a judge? Yeah, that guy was pretty racist even by 19th century standards. Maybe not the best person to have on the court. Yeah, as uh, legal historian Stuart Banner wrote, it is hard to imagine Judge Manning could have put all his disgust for the Māori and his hatred of his own job aside and devoted careful attention to the merits of each claim. Many officials most likely shared his indifference to issues of justice among Māori. For this reason, issues of the greatest importance to the Māori could be decided in the most casual, offhand way. But the story of the Native Land Court is less about individual decisions of corrupt or racist judges. It's more about how the court operated as an institution. For example, the 1840 rule, which meant the court would only consider land ownership as it existed when the treaty was signed. Think of Iwi and Hapu playing musical chairs with their territories and boundaries. And then, in 1840, the music stops. Those boundaries are locked in forever. This caused some problems because the treaty was signed in the aftermath of the Musket Wars and many tribes had temporarily evacuated traditional lands to escape their rivals. Mm. So if one iwi had moved out of an area to escape attack and another iwi set up a camp so they could take tuna from a local river, who owned that land? Tikanga Māori would usually privilege the first iwi given their deep links to the whenua through whakapapa, but the court, following the 1840 rule, might award the land to the second iwi. Also, for the first eight years, the court had something called the Ten Owners Rule. In short, it usually granted land blocks smaller than 5,000 acres to a group of only ten owners. Sometimes larger blocks were also granted to just ten people. In theory, those owners were trustees. They were supposed to represent everyone with rights to that land, potentially hundreds or even thousands of people. But in practice, any of the ten owners could sell the land without consulting anyone. A famous example was the 19,000-acre Hiritaunga block in the Hawke's Bay region. It was granted to ten owners in 1866. 17,000 acres of land were sold within three years, mostly to repay debts to storekeepers. In 1872, 554 Māori signed a petition to Parliament which said that the storekeepers urged the grantees to sell the portions for which they were trustees for others. The sale was urged before the grantees were aware of what they were doing. Consequently, they sold for a small price. Partly in response to that petition, the 10 owner rule was changed, so all members of a tribe could be named as owners. But ironically, this made it even easier for settlers to buy land. Every named owner was a potential target for land buyers, and if anyone sold, that affected everyone with rights to the land. Land purchasers did stuff like release livestock, cut down trees, drain wetlands, which made it very difficult for Māori to carry on life as normal. It's hard to harvest kiriru if the trees have been cut down, and it's hard to catch tuna if the wetlands have been drained. And even if some Māori wanted to adopt European-style agriculture, most couldn't because they struggled to access the cash to finance it. So given all of these problems, why did Māori agree to go to court in the first place? Well, some saw the court as a way of confirming their rights to land and resources. Some wanted money from land sales to invest in livestock or housing or, or new technologies. The Crown framed the court as a way for Māori to shore up property rights and better participate in the new colonial economy emerging up around them. But what the court actually did was get more land for colonists. And it was very good at it. One of the biggest reasons Māori were pulled into the court was to settle debts. Sometimes those were debts to storekeepers or private land speculators, but often they were debts to government departments. For example, here's part of a letter from a Crown land agent called James Mackay. 
I attempted in vain to get Ngāti Tamate Rā to treat for the sale of land to the government. They refused to take the governor's money. At this time, their old and influential chief Taraya Ngākuti died, and a very great feast was contemplated. And although the obstructives would not take money, they joined the friendly natives in procuring some thousands of pounds worth of flour, sugar, tobacco, tea, bullocks, sheep and clothing. So James Mackay is boasting about offering loans of food and supplies to grieving Māori so they could do their bit to support a tangihanga, then forcing those Māori to pay back the loans in land. This wasn't a one-off, by the way. Government agents and private land buyers often use tangi as opportunities to obtain land through loans. Maybe you could say, well, that's a bit ghoulish, but nobody was forcing Māori to take those loans. But even if you were never in debt, someone else's debt could drag you into court. Like if one Māori who had taken a loan needed to sell land to pay that debt, they could go to court on their own. But if other Māori with rights to the same land didn't turn up, well, the court sometimes just dealt with the person who was there. The others could miss out entirely and their land might be sold out from under them. And this was the key to the Native Land Court. A whole community could be forced to attend court by a single person who might have been caught up in debt. This undermined the system of collective decision-making, which was, and still is, a bedrock of Māori society. And this was no accident. Speaking in a parliamentary debate in 1870, Justice Minister Henry Sewell said the purpose of the land court was the detribalisation of the Māori, to destroy, if it were possible, the principle of communism upon which their social system is based. And once you found out you had to go to court, that was just the start of your problems. Hearings were almost always in colonial settlements, often far from kāinga Māori. Plus, there were no fixed dates for hearings. You could spend days travelling, then wait for weeks or months until the judge was ready to hear your case. And even presuming the court ruled in your favour, you then had to pay back all the debts you'd racked up while waiting. Going to the Native Land Court was expensive. Yeah, there were attendance fees, survey fees, lawyers' fees, food and accommodation costs. As the New Zealand Herald noted in 1883, unless the lands in which Māori are interested are of considerable value, more money is expended in securing them than they are worth. So, once again, Māori might go to court hoping to secure their land, but ended up so heavily in debt they had to sell the land anyway. The key point is that, in theory, the Native Land Court was voluntary. But in practice, many Māori had no choice but to engage with it. In theory, it secured Māori land ownership, but in practice, it eroded it. The court's form and function was different from outright confiscation, but it had the same effect. As Hone Kotsuku of Waikato put it in 1876, the sword of steel is put out of use, but the sword of deceit is used instead. Between 1840 and 1900, Māori land ownership collapsed from 26.8 million hectares to 2 million. Only about 7.5% of Aotearoa's total land area was left in Māori hands. And the court didn't just cost Māori their whenua. As one MP noted in a parliamentary debate, I believe we could not find a more ingenious method of destroying the whole Māori race than by these courts. The natives come from the villages of the interior and have to hang about for months in our centres of population. The result is a great number contract diseases and die. Plus, there were the problems of spending a long time away from home. You weren't available to look after elders or young children. You weren't around to plant the next year's crops. And it's not as if Māori were quiet about all of this. Between 1870 and 1900, Parliament received an average of 30 petitions complaining about the court every year. In the mid-1870s, iwi held several large hui calling for kotahitanga, unity or solidarity, between Māori all over Aotearoa. They became known as the kotahitanga movement, and together they petitioned the Crown to replace the native land court with a Māori-run institution and recognise a separate Māori parliament. Several kihapu and rangatira within the kotahitanga movement had supported the Crown during the New Zealand wars. So, of course, the Crown listened intently and took the kotahitanga movement's concerns very seriously. What? 
No, not really, of course. They basically ignored Kotahitanga requests. So in 1881, a Kotahitanga hui at Waitangi resolved to go higher up the chain. The next year of delegation of Rangatira travelled to England, hoping to meet with Queen Victoria. They had a petition requesting a royal commission to abrogate the evil laws affecting the Māori people and to establish a Māori parliament, which shall hold in check the European authorities who are endeavouring to set aside the Treaty of Waitangi. This petition specifically called out the various versions of the Native Lands Act, which it pointed out were not assented to by the native chiefs in all parts of the island, nor is there any basis in the Treaty of Waitangi for these laws, which continuously bring upon our lands and upon our persons great wrongs. The Queen carefully read this petition and, no, we all know what's going to happen here. This petition never reached the Queen. It was sent back to the New Zealand government, which more or less ignored it. Sounds frustrating. Oh, extremely frustrating. While the Kotahitanga movement never got the powers it sought, it did achieve something. It boosted national Māori unity. Not an easy feat. Yeah, remember how Justice Minister Henry Sewell said the goal of the court was the detribalisation of Māori. Well, it kind of worked, but not the way he was expecting. We're good at surprises, William. Iwi and hapu affiliation was still as important as ever, but no matter your tribe, everyone had a problem with the Native Land Court. That opposition helped forge a national Māori political identity, and this idea that all Māori share common interests is still a powerful feature of New Zealand politics today. Speaking of politics, some Māori fought the land court from within the Pākehā system. In 1867, Parliament established four Māori seats, and those Māori MPs frequently protested the land court, and they did achieve some measure of change. In the early 1900s, Native Affairs Minister James Carroll of Ngāti Kahungunu, along with a new generation of Māori leaders such as Apirana Ngata of Ngāti Pūrō, made repeated attempts to reform Māori land laws. The most important were known as incorporation and consolidation. That meant taking land titles split between dozens or even hundreds of Māori and bringing them together in holding companies that worked in the best interests of all those owners. Some of these incorporations are still around. For example, Parininihiki Waitotara. Today it manages more than 20,000 hectares in the Taranaki region. There's also the Māwhera Incorporation on Te Taipotini, which owns and manages large chunks of Greymouth. Carol, Ngata and their allies managed to slow down the pace of land alienation. It became known as the Taihua or Hold Up Policy, but it didn't last. Between 1911 and 1921, nearly a million more hectares of Māori land was sold. And as the 20th century unfolded, the 19th century idea that Māori and Māori land needed to make way for Pākehā who would make New Zealand more productive persisted. Probably the clearest example was the 1967 Māori Affairs Amendment Act. Yep, this was still going on in the 1960s. And among other things, this act gave government agents known as improvement officers the power to investigate Māori land. If they thought that land wasn't being used productively, the owners could be forced to sell it. Productively in the Pākehā sense. But the backlash to this law was massive. In fact, some suggest it was a key catalyst for the so-called Māori Renaissance, a rebirth of Māori activism. Groups like the Māori Women's Welfare League, the Federation of Māori Students, the Māori Graduates Association and the New Zealand Māori Council described it as the last great land grab. Over the next decades, new youth protest movements like Ngā Tamatoa sprung up, partly in response to the ongoing alienation of Māori land. People like Fina Cooper, a founder of the Māori Women's Welfare League, argued that presenting submissions to Parliament wasn't enough. Direct action was needed. So, in 1975, she led a hikwe from Northland to Wellington. Along the way, the marches stopped at local marae and the hikwe grew. Their famous catch cry was, not one more acre, meaning all remaining Māori land should remain in Māori ownership. The hikwe was 5,000 strong by the time it arrived at Parliament. Fina Cooper, later to become Dame Fina, presented a petition signed by 60,000 people demanding an end to the alienation of Māori land. Over the 1970s and 80s, there were a number of reforms, including the establishment of the Waitangi Tribunal, which was given powers to investigate historical injustices, including actions of the Native Land Court. Finally, 
1993, Parliament passed Te Ture Whenua Māori Act. After 128 years, the court's power to alienate Māori land was removed. But the court still shapes Māori lives today. For one thing, the 1993 Act makes it illegal to alienate Māori land in reserves or native title. On one hand, that means the whenua can never leave the hands of the traditional owners. But on the other, because the land can never be sold, it means it can never be used to raise a loan, which makes it difficult for those landowners to build houses or start farming. The treaty claim settlement process has also undone some of the injustices done by the Native Land Court. The Crown has given official apologies, transferred some land back into Māori ownership, and, as of 2018, paid more than $2.2 billion to iwi in monetary compensation. Some of those payments have been used to purchase back parts of tribal estates on the open market. But these payments and the partial recovery of land represent a tiny fraction of what the Native Land Court cost Māori. Māori once owned all the land in Aotearoa. Today, many thousands of tangata whenua lack whenua. Our people deal with low rates of home ownership and high rates of homelessness. A big reason for that is the Native Land Court. It all goes to show, history is rarely in the past. Kia ora, thanks for watching our show. If you want to know more about the Native Land Court, we've put a list of some of our sources in the description. One we found particularly useful was Te Kōti Tango Whenua, the Native Land Court, 1864-1909 to by David Williams. Hei kona.